Good morning, everybody. It's Sam Culper from Forward Observer. Welcome back to the fifth and final edition of Breaking Down Civil War II. I'm sure I'll make more videos on Civil War II, but this is the end of this series. One thing before we get started, a commenter asked me this morning whether my assessment has changed in light of last week's attack on the detention facility by a radical anarchist, and the answer is no. That is low-level violence. That's exactly the thing that I've been describing. It's going to get worse. It's probably going to last for years, if not longer. And that is low-intensity conflict. It's already here. This thing that people call the Civil War has already started. Standard caveat on predictions. I don't make predictions. No one can predict with any certainty what's going to happen. These events are complex. Maybe far in the future, we're looking at an incalculable number of variables. There are black swans, white swans. No one knows exactly what's going to happen, but we can reduce our uncertainty about the future. We can begin to separate what's more likely, what's less likely, and have more realistic expectations of the future. Welcome to part five. Today, I'm talking about the military and law enforcement, my thoughts and expectations. First, we'll talk about defections before we get too hot to try it. There are some implications we need to consider. Then we'll talk about some more specific hard facts and data on how the military works. We'll talk about some military missions in the Boogaloo. And then I'll end on some thoughts about law enforcement and gun confiscation during this period based on what we know about other similar conflicts. So let's get down to business. Now, Honestly, it's kind of far-fetched for me to be talking about quote-unquote military defections, but it's been brought up a lot of times before people are genuinely interested in this, so here are my thoughts. Will parts of the military defect? I'm sure lots of people would love to hear me say that, yes, yeah, 75% of the military is going to defect and this civil war is going to be over in 72 hours flat. It sounds like a lot of people think that. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is not if parts of the military will defect, but at what point might they defect? What would the trigger be? And I sincerely ask, what president is going to cross that line? Does the president who crosses that line understand the implications of what he or she is doing? Does the president realize that he or she is about to get wrecked? And if that's the case, then I would ask, is it worth risking everything? I think a good maxim in general when we're talking about the future is the more extreme the prediction, the less likely it is to occur. Now, extreme things don't happen too frequently. That's why they are extreme. That's why they are low frequency events. But I ask, why would a president who has advisors and civilian administrators of the military along with generals, why would that president risk some right-wing military revolt, especially on the topic of the Second Amendment? I don't think that's a hill that a leftist administration is going to want to literally die on. And so really, it just seems to me that we might not actually get to this point where a president would actually cross the line and you would have these kinds of uh, mass defections or some military coup take place in D.C. You have to understand this military is going to have policies that are shaped by their civilian administrators and the presidential administration. There's a civilian secretary of the Army, the Navy, so on, appointed by the president, and that secretary pursues and implements the policies set forth by the administration. Now, this military that would be faced with a potential defection or desertion scenario would be under a leftist regime. The higher the rank you attain, the more political your rank becomes. I wouldn't expect a leftist administration to promote hardline constitutionalists into positions of prominence or power, especially if that president had in mind banning or confiscating firearms. There's a huge push for diversity and a huge push to promote soldiers with this kind of mentality. That's not very important among the lower ranks, but the higher up you rise, the more important that stuff becomes. So what I think we'll see is fewer conservatives joining the military under a leftist administration, especially if those recruits understand who their commander-in-chief would be. Now, if this were a concern for a leftist president, then I would expect that president to work towards neutering the military, or at least removing those with opposing political views from any positions of power and authority. Remember that whole thing about Obama's domestic army and building up DHS, I think that really is the best option here for a leftist president. You take away some power from the military, you hand it over to a more domestic army that you can control. And I think that's actually a lot more likely. Also, we're dealing with feedback loops here. Part of being a good analyst is recognizing 
when an enemy decision maker is getting positive feedback loops, i.e. being encouraged to continue with a particular course of action. And then there's the opposite of that, which is negative feedback loops and understanding when an enemy decision maker is being pressured or discouraged to change a course of action due to this negative feedback. There's that quote attributed to Lenin. Yes, this is one of the only times I'm quoting Lenin. It goes something like, probe with bayonet. If you encounter steel, stop. If you encounter bush, push. I think that's a very instructive quote. I have a hard time believing that a left-wing president is going to make a decision so incendiary that it would cause the military to revolt. Because you replace upper echelon military leaders with basically members of, quote-unquote, the party, and you no longer have that problem. And we see this happen in a lot of authoritarian governments. So I'm not sure we're going to get to this point in our conflict where there are mass military defections, where you raid the arms room and make off like a bandit and go join up with the rebels. I'm doubtful for reasons that I'll explain throughout this video. It's not impossible, but in terms of what's more likely and less likely, I think we can draw a good distinction here because there are more likely scenarios. Now that said, there are a lot of liberals, progressives, and leftists in the military. You might recall the story of Spencer Rapone, an enlisted infantry soldier who graduated from West Point, was a second lieutenant for a while before being kicked out of the army. There he is with his cap that read, Communism will win on the inside, and another photo of him wearing a Che Guevara shirt under his military academy uniform. 50 years ago, he would have been kicked out of the army by lunch after being on the receiving end of a severe beating by his peers. But it took the army about a year after these photos were publicized, and it wasn't immediately clear that he was actually going to be kicked out. Now, apparently he became disillusioned about war after two tours in Afghanistan, like many of us did. Uh, but at some point, this guy was radicalized during his stay at the West Point Inn and Suites, allegedly by a radical professor there. And who knows how many other Spencer Rapones there are in the military. Point is, these kinds of shitbags exist in the military, and they're the ones who are going to be getting promoted into positions of power by a leftist administration. Now, for there to be defections, we'd really have to be at a point of no return. Our founders designed an election system that, in theory, would prevent an absolute dictatorship. We have checks and balances, we have separate but equal powers, and we also have regular elections. Now, in theory, that prevents mass revolutionary behavior because you'll get another chance to win back some part of government every two to four years. Now, I've made my expectations of the future well known. I think we probably are headed toward one party rule. That certainly seems to be the most likely scenario going forward. But when we talk about military defections here, I think we would really have to get to a point of absolute and very clear cut violations of the Constitution for which there was no political solution. And that's the key there. We'd have to get to a point where it couldn't be solved in the courts. It's not going to be solved by Congress. It can't be solved by the voters. And a military intervention would be the very last resort. I think that is on the far extreme end of the spectrum here. Now, what we're going to get prior to defections, things that are more likely in my estimation, which have happened under Clinton and Obama, are resignations. Officers resigning their commissions, soldiers not re-enlisting, and instead going back home. And maybe they push for state-level resistance once they get back. In all likelihood, though, if party leaders were really concerned about a potential coup or military revolt, they'd just replace generals and colonels with soldiers from within their party, just like every leftist government does. You stop the career advancement of the hardliners and promote party members. And I think something like that is far more likely if and when we do get some left-wing authoritarian government. As far as soldiers defecting, we have to consider two other factors here, like retirement and benefits. You put in 15 or 17 years, you're thinking about retirement. You leave before then and it's gone. And also, lots of soldiers have kids. They have dependents. They get extra money for those dependents. So for an E5, a sergeant, or E6 or E7 to defect and leave the military, they're giving up TRICARE or health insurance for their family. They're giving up free housing or subsidized housing with BAH. They're giving up a job and a career that they may really enjoy. And as long as they aren't being ordered to do anything unconstitutional, I think they'll just wait until their contract is up try to save some money, and then get out. If something large-scale did happen, I would expect it to be led by some generals or some colonels as the first big movers. And if it did get to that point, then I think you would get lots of others to follow. Another factor to consider is if you go AWOL, absent without leave, you moved your family back home, you lost your benefits, you lost your job and income, and now you violated the UCMJ Bigley, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. 
and the current regime is going to view you as a traitor. Maybe you wear that as a badge of honor. Maybe a lot of people do. I would. But you better make sure that your side wins. The only way I see rank and file defections or desertions is if soldiers aren't getting paid or they're ordered to violate the Constitution. Now, I'll tell you a quick story as it was relayed to me by a good friend when he graduated from the Q course to join U.S. Special Forces. On graduation day, the battalion sergeant major gathered all the enlisted men. This was around the time Obama was reelected. He gathered up all the enlisted men and told them that if there were to come a time that they'd have to choose on which side to serve, that they were going to have to choose to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And to a man, every soldier understood exactly what that sergeant major was saying, and they met afterward to discuss what had just happened, just to be clear. And they all unanimously agreed. There are a lot of those kinds of soldiers in the military, and that's a primary driver for a lot of Americans to join to defend the country, and at some point in this theoretical thought exercise we're having, they may be having conversations very much like the one I just described. But I don't think we're at that point yet, and really it's premature to guess exactly what will happen because there are numerous scenarios where these effects would differ. I think resignations would be far more likely than anyone engaging in a conventional civil war. We're still very much in the territory of low-intensity conflict, so we will move on. Now, there are three classes of units in the Army and Marine Corps. The Air Force and Navy may have something similar. I'm not a fly guy or a seaman, so I really can't speak to those branches. Now, combat arms includes the infantry, artillery, armor, which is basically tanks, and then you have special operations forces, which includes rangers, special forces, marine raiders, SEALs, CAG, other groups, and they are the direct action arms of the military. In the last video, we talked about the guerrillas and how they represent a small part of the overall effort, something like 10 or 20%, and then the remaining 80 or 90% are various forms of support. Well, it's kind of the same thing in the military. And then we talked in part four about this tooth to tail ratio, how for every trigger puller, there are on average seven support personnel historically. That ratio was something like 20 to one or 30 to one in Iraq and Afghanistan. So we're talking about lots of support for comparatively few combat arms troops. Now behind combat arms, there's a class called combat support. And these are branches like military intelligence in no particular order, of course. Military intelligence, engineers, signal, aviation, military police, chemical, maybe a few others. And their job is to provide direct support to combat operations. Military intelligence provides targeting and an understanding of the battlefield and enemy situation. Engineers build bunkers and roads and facilities, and sometimes they just drive around and run over IEDs. Signal are the combo guys that make your radios and computers work. Aviation is like Enterprise. They'll come pick you up if you can make the flight manifest. Occasionally, they shoot bad guys. And then you have military police who make sure that you're not speeding while on base. I was written a ticket on Camp Bastion in Afghanistan for driving a Polaris too fast, and it wasn't even a U.S. base. And that's what these guys did for their entire deployment, is write tickets for people who are driving too fast. And yeah, I'm still butthurt about that ticket. And finally, we have combat service support. Things like supply and logistics, transportation, maintenance, motor pool medical, and personnel and finance. Their wartime job is to provide logistical support to combat arms. Now, if you've noticed a trend here, it's that every branch outside of combat arms exists to facilitate combat arms unit operations. There was an old saying back when I enlisted, there are 212 ways to join the army and 211 support the infantry. Now, why is all this important to know? Well, we have to understand that the infantry is generally very good at doing their thing doing all the support work required to keep them fighting in the field is not their forte. They are not supply. They are not intelligence. They're not signals. They're not anything but infantry. And they're going to find ways to make do and get by without all this stuff. But ask infantry guys what happens when a radio breaks in the field and it doesn't get repaired or replaced. And ask them what happens when a gun truck breaks down and there's no motor pool and no spare parts. Ask them what happens when fuel supplies run out or food and water runs out or when ammo runs out. And all of a sudden, those operations begin to break down too. Point is, these three classes exist for a reason. If we're talking about defections, unless you get defections from all three classes, a lot of these operational capabilities are going to slow down. Now, my next question regarding defections is what would their missions be? In this civil war where people are talking about defections, what would First Cav right up the road at Fort Hood do? 
What would defected troops from the 101st Airborne out at Campbell do? What would these units scattered all across the country and, and actually all across the world, what would they actually be doing if they defected? I think what's more likely than mass defections or even a conventional civil war is something broadly referred to as military operations other than war or MUTWA. I know, the army goes crazy on this acronym stuff. We would see missions like humanitarian aid and peacekeeping, and most importantly, something called military assistance to civil disturbances. MACDIS, or military assistance to civil disturbances, is where the military, either the National Guard or active duty components, are called out to help civilian officials tamp down on civil disturbances. They'll guard critical infrastructure, they'll enforce curfews or maybe martial law in some places, this is fundamentally about restoring order. We're talking about a massive amount of political instability if this were to happen, and it's important that order across the country is maintained. Now, regardless of what's happening in Washington, D.C., I would expect the military, as long as they're being paid and have the capabilities to do this, to be involved largely in peacekeeping, not war fighting. Let's look at some of the possibilities. Dispersing unlawful assemblies like mobs, looters, and other mass criminal activity. Maybe that includes uh, stopping people from storming government buildings. If there were a grassroots revolution on the left or the right or some kind of major insurgent type of disturbance, I would expect some of these military units to actually intervene. Even if these soldiers or commanders generally supported the intent, these commanders, they don't know who you are. They don't know what you're up to. They can't tell what side you're on. These people don't trust you. And you know what they're interested in during this mission? Keeping the peace and restoring order. I would expect these military commanders, if they were to be involved across the country, to take control of the situation and restore and maintain some semblance of order. Patrolling disturbed areas is another activity we would expect during MACDIS. There is a concept called show of force, and basically that's to deter anyone from doing anything stupid. We can look at several instances of insurgencies where the military's mission is to keep the peace regardless of who's doing the fighting. Even if senior leaders of the military did stage a coup, the rest of the military would be ordered to keep the peace. I would not expect a majority of military leaders to support some runaway French revolution across the country. Preventing the commission of unlawful acts is standard practice in response to civil disturbances. Again, the military is there to keep the peace, not settle political scores. Providing a quick reaction force, a QRF, might be necessary to support civilian governance. A military unit might be mobilized or deployed to provide QRF to law enforcement, for instance. Distributing essential goods and services and providing humanitarian aid to the populace is a common practice we've seen, especially overseas. Maintaining essential services can include guarding critical infrastructure or otherwise ensuring that essential services help keep the peace. One of the worst ways to compound a civil disturbance is through the disruption of essential services like water and electricity, thus creating more unrest. Establishing traffic control points, or TCPs and cordons, is a frequent practice to control the flow of traffic in and out of an area. If you want to screen the populace for contraband and weapons, you set up TCPs and vehicle searches, especially if you're trying to defeat some armed insurrection. So in this scenario, where the military would actually intervene or get involved somehow, I think this is years away, if not a decade or longer, Here's what we're probably dealing with. These are my key assumptions. Number one, low morale in the military, especially for conservative soldiers, because it's been turned into a social experiment. Career advancement is great for SJWs, not so great for everyone else. Two, fewer conservatives join the military, because why would you want to put your life on the line to fight some globalist war or to protect half the country that doesn't even like you and to serve a left-wing administration working feverishly to take away your rights and change your way of life. I think fewer conservatives stay in for the same reason. I think these people go home and they look for ways to support their red state governments in deterring or pushing back on these leftist laws. In three, budget cuts are probably going to reduce the size of the military anyway. Democrats need all that extra money to pay for free health care and humanities degrees for illegal immigrants. So my point is, just like the military has changed a lot over the past 20 years, it's going to keep progressing. It's becoming more progressive by the year, and eventually it may no longer be the conservative institution than it's historically been. Things can change, administrations can intervene, but this is undeniably the trend. Now, unfortunately, I can't predict the future, but I would reiterate 
that the next stop on this train is probably European style socialism. I think that we are going to flirt with democratic socialism, with European style big government. I hear a lot about how based and red pilled Gen Z is. Well, if you look at the numbers more clearly, white kids in Generation Z are more conservative. But as a whole, Generation Z is more diverse and more liberal than the millennial generation. Others point out that as generations get older, they tend to become more conservative. I don't dispute that whatsoever. The problem is you look at the economic factors that have pushed a lot of these millennials towards socialism, and they got slammed with the 2008 recession. They graduated high school or they graduated college. They couldn't get jobs. They're 20 or 30% behind where their parents were at this stage of their lives. Many of them live at home because they can't afford a home. And when we look ahead at this next recession and what's probably gonna be years of low growth until we finally get to this financial reckoning, I think Generation Z is going to go through very similar effects and I think probably be changed in a very similar way. That's one thing I continue to look at. I don't think that's 100%, but right now that's my key assumption until I start seeing data to convince me otherwise. Point is, I think we probably are headed towards European style socialism. Collusion between the leftists in big tech and the leftists in the Democratic Party are going to ensure that any dissent is censored or shadow banned. And I would refer you back to part two of this video series where I lay out the agenda for how the leftists come into power and how they win the war without going to war. That's an important part of our baseline understanding. Also, I don't think the leftists in control are going to give the military an opportunity to step in. After amnesty or a pathway to citizenship, a lot of their plan can just happen organically and semi-legally because now they have the voters. But I do see individual states moving back to nullification just like they did during the Obama administration. And on the topic of triggers, let's talk about gun confiscation because that is by far the single most pressing issue for a lot of us. I know what these Democrats have said or are saying. Trump said that he was going to build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. There are some things that you say when you're running for president and maybe you have every intention of making that happen. But you get to D.C. and you realize it's just not in the cards. Guys, door-to-door -door gun confiscation in the United States is not going to last very long, if it happens at all. Basically, politicians are telling their constituents what they want to hear. They're competing in the woke Olympics. They continue to try to convince the voting public that utopia is achievable through left-wing fascism. And basically, what these politicians are telling police to do is risk their lives over a gun. And it's only going to take a few fatal funnels before this kind of confiscation ends. How they're going to try to take your guns is through registry databases and through these red flag laws. And they're not going to come in when you're at home. They're going to detain you when you're at work or when you're out with your kids. And then they're going to raid your house. And then they're going to get your safe or they're going to find your guns because some anonymous chicken shit called the police and told them that you're a big scary man with guns. Also, this is not going to happen in every state. And it's not going to happen in every jurisdiction. But I'd bet dollars to donuts that it's eventually going to happen somewhere and a community is going to rise up and put a judge or a politician in some hot water because they confiscated the wrong man's guns. And that's going to be a local or regional conflict, which I tried to better describe in the last video. This stuff is not going to happen in rural Nebraska where it's 80% Republican. It's going to happen in bigger cities and metro areas where leftist politicians think they know what's best for you and maybe they will for a while, but they eventually won't and they're going to start getting poked back and that's where you're going to have a local or regional conflict. That is low intensity conflict and that's exactly what's coming to America if they keep going down the road on guns. And also I should add, even if they don't keep going down the road on guns, that's exactly where we're headed if we keep going down the road that we're on. So some states are going to pass these laws. They're going to selectively enforce those laws. And I mean very selectively. While they keep pushing out this anti-gun propaganda and indoctrination in the classroom, that's eventually going to put a squeeze on gun culture. So take a kid shooting. And really the last thing I need to cover is law enforcement. You're going to have three or four kinds of law enforcement out there. The first kind is going to refuse to enforce gun laws against otherwise law-abiding citizens. We're already seeing sheriffs do this. And these guys might even turn a blind eye to a few things, this being a political struggle and all. The second kind might be pro-gun, 
but he's very pro order. And if you break the law during the boogaloo, he doesn't know you, he doesn't trust you, and he doesn't care what your intentions are. You broke the law and he's doing his job. Have fun in jail. And the third kind believes that utopia can be achieved through left-wing fascism. These guys are in a lot of places, but they mostly exist in the big cities where you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Now, there's a fourth kind of law enforcement that doesn't necessarily have to do with gun confiscation, but I do expect as economic conditions deteriorate for there to be growing levels of corruption in law enforcement, that's already a concern in a lot of areas and that's just gonna continue to grow as a concern. Now, this is not going to be the last video I do on Civil War II as long as I'm breathing. The next one won't be part six. I'll probably just address some specific topic. And I'll also start taking some of the questions that have been posted in the comments and begin answering them in future videos. You're gonna to wanna to watch those too, so be sure to subscribe. And if you want to read my daily and weekly reports, head over to my website. You can go to forwardobserver.com trial and sign up for a free seven-day trial. Try it before you buy it. It's been real. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I hope I've at least maybe expanded your thinking on the topic. Thanks for watching. And until next time, stay out front.